In the last episode of the Corsair series, we left off the painting and we're about to move into weathering. So in this episode, we are going to do some chipping and oils to complete the model. And just to recap the last episode, the painting included the first layer of a lacquer, followed by chipping fluid, followed by another lacquer, then an acrylic to chip off that lacquer a little bit easier, and then the final color. Before starting chipping though, I painted the aircraft number on the side of the fuselage using a stencil created with my silhouette machine. And to make things a little more visually interesting, I also included some overspray, which was also visible in the reference photo as well. I'm sure some IPMS judges may look at this and penalize me for it, but I know why it's there and I honestly don't really care if they like it or not. You have to remember that these markings were painted on in the field and not done in a factory controlled setting. Now let's get to the chipping. In the last video, I did the first layer of chipping using the silver and the zinc chromate yellow, and then I put an acrylic paint on top of that because it doesn't stick so well to lacquer and makes it easier to chip the paint. So as I lightly start jabbing at the wing here, you're gonna see some small chips start to appear. And if I wanna make bigger or larger chips, I'll focus in one area and really put some more water there to reactivate that acrylic paint below. The thing with chipping is it's one of those techniques that it's very easy to overdo. But luckily with a Corsair that was based in the Pacific, we can really beat this model up and still be within the ballpark. You can also use some different types of brushes and objects to create variation in the chipping. You can use stiff short brushes, you can use deer foot stipplers, you can even use toothpicks and sewing needles for the finer ones. In the end, the best way to create the look of chipped paint is to actually chip the paint. If you're going to use tweezers or a sewing needle to also chip the paint, you don't want to stab it or try to scratch it. You want to just let that object bounce because after a few seconds it'll start to chip the paint away and give you very tiny microscopic chips. If you're using lacquers on top of your chipping fluid, another way you can start to gradually chip it as well is using a high grit sandpaper to wear through the paint, which is what also naturally happens. Let's just take a moment and talk about what actually happens to an aircraft when it's parked on the ground, even in current day. You have an aircraft, it's parked on the ground, there's gonna be grit, dirt on the bottom of somebody's shoes or boots. They're gonna climb up on the wing and they're gonna scuff up that paint, especially when they're there for a few hours, refueling it, checking the oil, changing components. And it's just a abrasive process on that paint. People will tell you that aircraft don't get weathered or no cruise chief will ever let something get that destroyed. But the reality is, in this case, this aircraft was in a high operational tempo in the Pacific, and touching up paint just wasn't a high priority to the ground crews. It was more important to keep them flying. If you're having trouble believing the crew would let the aircraft get that beat up, take a second here, hit pause, and Google CF-18 Hornet. The Canadian Hornets, they have a lot of wear and tear on those aircraft, and they're not in a wartime setting, so just keep that in mind. Even if you spend a few minutes on the internet just Googling World War II aircraft, especially in Burma and the China theaters, these aircraft were at the end of a very long supply line and they showed it. Still don't believe me that aircraft can get dirty and crew chiefs let the aircraft get like that? Check out current photos of any aircraft based on a US aircraft carrier. At the end of those tours, those things are beat. With the chipping pretty much completed, it's now time to come in and do some post shading. And the idea here is just to bring in some more variation in the paint before coming in with the oils, especially in areas like the fuel tank cover where you would constantly have leaking fuel, which doesn't get along with paint. Plus on this Corsair being an earlier version, there was no tape around the panel lines of the fuel tank there. So a lot of the fuel would seep out in the seams giving you those really nasty spills and the streaking around the nose area. Like I said in my last video, this was one of my first times really trusting the process and not trying to tidy things up and clean them up before moving to the next step. And just knowing that the next few stages would tone down that weathering. The only downfall of the Tamiya kit, like all of their kits, is unfortunately the decals are too thick. So I picked up a set of HGW's wet transfers when I bought the seatbelt. And the nice thing about these is after they're dry, you can remove the carrier film. Just be careful when you're doing this on top of paint that has chipping fluid underneath it because you can have a bad time. Cylinders on the landing gear were painted with a Molotov chrome pen. 
I used a neutral gray panel line wash for the landing gear because I found that the black wash on top of white paint was too harsh and it was almost jarring to look at. The wash was put straight onto lacquer paint and then wiped off with a q-tip and a shop towel. I didn't have to do any scrubbing and there was no clear coats used. One thing to watch out for when you're building this kit is if you decide to test fit the main landing gear, they fit so well and so tight that they actually are difficult to pull back out. So once you put those in place, you're pretty much committed. I used some German grey paint and a stencil to break up the black on the propeller blade just before starting with oils. Oil paints are something I'm still getting used to and getting a handle on, but a great help to me has been the fact that Mike Rinaldi is doing live streams with his methods of oil blending, and also Will Pattison on his channel did a great series on oils and aircraft models. After adding some thin down layers of oils onto the tire, I then blended it out using a dry brush. And it took a few minutes to do this, but it gives that tire a very dusty, worn look. Once the oils were finished on the tires, I then added some dust pigment just to really bring them to life, especially in all the treads. For the worn effect on the leading edge of the propeller blades, I simply used some sanding sponge to sand down the black paint on top of the silver paint underneath. Using a sanding sponge gives you a lot of control over how much wear and tear you're putting down on the aircraft. One cool effect I always see in reference photos of Corsairs is silver exposed rivet heads. And to mimic that effect, I'm actually putting acrylic drops of paint down inside the rivets on the model. And because this is on top of a lacquer paint, I simply come in with a cloth afterwards and wipe away that acrylic paint, which leaves it down in the rivet hole. Think of it as a more controlled wash. I tried Duke's method with the AK Extreme Metal paints, but I found it was very difficult to remove that even with some thinner. The acrylic paint was much easier to remove. Even though the fabric sections of the Corsair's wings were covered in the same primer and paint as the metal parts of the aircraft, for some reason it faded a lot faster than the metal. So to accent this, I blended in some oil paints. This is done through a few layers of oil paints, and rather than wait for them to dry, I just use a hair dryer to speed up that process. I've also left this uncut so you can see how fast you can really change things up with oil paints. I followed the same process for doing the smoke staining underneath the aircraft. However, instead of using a soft blending brush, I ended up using a steerfoot stippler just to randomly break up the paint. You can also see in this clip that the fabric sections of the wing and the flap are a little bit lighter than the metal sections, but not drastically overdone. Because this is a land-based Corsair, the bottom of the wings wouldn't be seeing that much sunlight, and a lot of this is more of staining from the coral dust as well. Neutral grey paint was added to the smoke stains just to make them a little more interesting, and to accent the area where those shells would be very hot coming out of the ejection chutes. The same process was followed for the exhaust stains on the bottom of the aircraft. Rather than trying to do the smoke stain in one single layer, I slowly built up the layers of oils until I was happy with how the exhaust staining looked. The beautiful thing about oil paints is if you're not happy with how something's looking, you can just take a cloth with some enamel thinner and simply wipe it away and start again. Because the top of the aircraft is constantly exposed to the sun and the Pacific conditions, I really went to town with damaging and fading out the paint. I don't think there are any other weathering mediums that can compare to oils when it comes to weathering an aircraft and changing the way things look. Based on the amount of oil paint you use, how much you thin it, what brushes you use, you can get a lot of different effects. You can create filters and washes, you can create paint fade, and you can even do a lot of tonal difference as well in the paint. You can also make stains. One of the more interesting stains I found on a Corsair was where it looked like the ground crew had been filling with using a hand pump and then may have accidentally pulled the nozzle out too soon while there was flow in the hose, 
and it spilled a lot of fuel on the side of the aircraft. And that was just something that was too cool not to replicate. Based on the amount of damage to the paint from fuel, it probably wasn't the first time it was spilled either. The access hatch for filling oil was another area that showed a lot of spills and weathering. As the last few layers of oils go down on this model, I just wanted to expand on my comments from the last video. And the whole point of this build was that I wanted to show that you could fully weather an aircraft and do it heavily and still have it look good. I think there's a misunderstanding from a lot of people that planes don't get dirty or they don't get that worn out. But the fact is if you get up close to aircraft, you can see that that is simply not true. Now this Corsair itself, it's in a very, very rough condition. It's got people climbing all over it, sitting coral dust on it. It's flying every day, it's a high tempo, and it's gonna sh reflect that. Even Canada's CF-18s in the year 2021, they show a lot of wear and tear on them as well. And if you ever get a chance to get up close, you should really look at things like the leading edges, weapon pylons, and anywhere that's exposed like that, because you'll see a lot of chipping and wear as well. And don't forget that tasty, tasty streaking and leaks on those as well. So if a plane can be that dirty when it's not in a war zone, imagine how much worse it would be when it was. You can sum up this build pretty quickly, and that's because the Tamiya Corsair almost falls together. There's no roadblocks to run into, and when it's all together, it's a beautiful model. The only downfall I can really say about it is the fact that Anything you're doing in 132 scale is large, and it can feel like it's on the bench for a very long time. I tend to prefer 148 because it feels like the builds progress pretty quickly, but when something's this big, you're definitely spending a lot more time building it, and that can unfortunately drag on you a little bit. That's not to say I didn't enjoy building this model, it's just that at the end of that, I'm ready to change it up from a plane to something different, just for a little bit of a shakeup. I would also like to take a minute to thank my supporters on Patreon. They're able to get behind the scenes photos, blog posts, and depending on what scale you're at, you get one week early ad-free videos or 24 hour early videos with no ads. If you're not able to support the channel financially, that's fine. You can just support it by clicking on subscribe, like, and letting your friends know. And make sure you hit that bell so you don't miss any of the videos. I am the Model Guy and I'll see you next time.